going on guys we're back out here tonight we're gonna get this table knocked out we're gonna start working on the pan so I'm gonna break four sections two feet long and I'll stitch weld them together because my break will only do 24 inches wide I'm gonna take and cut this into two foot strips and then we'll be able to go ahead and break those this is probably the hardest part in my opinion of the project building the table wasn't too bad I think that's pretty fun but this this section here is going to be a little tougher because we want all of our pans broke exactly the same we want them to match we'll go ahead and get these laid out and start cutting them with the plasma and then we'll go from there. Okay, so we're ready to start laying these out and breaking them. So these are 24 by 24. So it's going to drop 10 inches. It's going to come out 12 inches and it's going to have a 2 inch lip. So we'll just go ahead and lay these out. And what we've talked before about when you're breaking things, you got to pay attention to how much it's going to, how much your measurements are going to grow. You don't have to worry about it on something like this because if it's a little bit longer or a little bit wider really doesn't matter you just want them all to be consistent so if you lay them all out the same and break them all the same in theory they should all be they should all be the same once you get them broke okay so we got it all laid out we're going to take it over to the break and try breaking the first one see how it goes all right so we're going to start with our smallest break first it's exactly as wide as the break and this is really hard to feather so I don't think I want this at a total 90. I want to leave it kind of open a little bit. I'm going to check that, something like that. But I think I want it a little bit more, which is scary because with this machine, usually when you want it to be a little bit more, it ends up being too much. Look at this saint. Look at that saint over there bringing us lunch. That's a good woman right there. I'm gonna go eat. Okay, so I feel pretty good about that. Now I'm gonna try and break the other one. Whew. This one is getting broken at a 90. Alright, so 
We got our pan pieces all broke. You can see I did over break one of them. It's not that big a deal. I'll be able to massage it and get it tweaked out to where it needs to be. Hopefully you guys could see it. I know it was in warp mode, so it was going really fast, but the way that I was checking these angles to make sure that they were consistent, and so I would break it, and when I thought it was getting close, then I'd pull it off and I'd grab this, and I'd check it. Okay, so you can see these are all really close. So I was able to just check and get those all, all within about an eighth of an inch. And I might have to tap a couple of them with a hammer to get them lined up, but that's the best way that I've found to get those brakes as consistent as possible so that when you do go to fit it up, you don't have to sit and fight it and spend a whole bunch of time making everything line up. So I think we're gonna use short arc to stitch these up. So we'll just put some small stitches on them. That'll be enough to hold it for what we're doing. So that's what we'll work on right now. Okay, so we got our pans sitting on the table. Joints look pretty good. So we'll be able to stitch these together pretty good, I think. One of the reasons I want to get that press up and running is because you got a tighter angle here than you do here. And that's why when you look at these joints, you can see they're just a little off. And so I'm just going to take a crescent wrench, tweak this side out so that they're the same and then we'll be able to weld them up. It's not a huge deal, but when I have that up and running, I'll be able to throw the press brake attachment in that and use that, and I'll be able to, one, feather it, so I'll be able to get my angles a lot more accurate. The other thing it'll do is I'm hoping that I don't run into this issue. We're gonna get the short arc machine rolled out, and we're gonna start fitting these up. We'll go to that point. Okay, grab that other. L quiet. Never mind, it's right here. So to fix these, I'm just gonna take my crescent wrench, tweak these a little bit. Yeah, that looks dang good there. So let's do the same thing to that one. I'm going to start, this is the end that's good, this one's too tight, so I'm going to start about where I think it needs to be tweaked and work this way now. Now if we want to check it, it's pretty dang close. Okay, so you guys can see our joints look a lot better now. So we'll be able to tack those up. And these are off just a hair, but it's not gonna matter because we're gonna tack them or pull them together. You know, you've got quite a bit of movement on a piece this big that's only 10 gauge, so we'll be able to pull those together and tack them up. It looks like this one here needs a trim. So I'm gonna trim this top edge and taper it down to this so that I can butt that up tight. And that could be one of two things. It was either when I broke it, I didn't break it straight in line with the line that I laid out, or my cut line wasn't straight. Quite frankly, it could be either. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start tacking these up and we'll go from there. Okay, for those of you who are wondering, we're running our Short arc machine at 18.3 volts, 293 inches a minute. 
and I may adjust that up and down depending on how it runs. Okay, so I want a little bit of a bevel here where I'm going to weld these. So I'm just going to hit the spots where I'm going to put a little stitch and give it just a little bit of a, a bevel so that I'm getting better penetration for this pan. I'm just going to start, I felt this back corner, it's nice and flush, so I'm going to start with a tack right here. Is the gas on? Okay, and any, any stitch weld we put in the bottom of this pan, we're going to want to probably buff it so that it's close to flush, because that material is going to be rolled up in here, and we don't want to have it snagging on there. So I'm going to put one stitch here in the bottom, I'll have a stitch here holding that lip together. I'll have one here and then one here at the top. And that should hold it together plenty good enough for what it's going to be used for. And it's not like it's holding a ton of weight. Okay, so now what we're going to do, I'm going to have Bridger take this wrench and he's going to tweak that down to where it needs to be and I'm going to tack it. I may be able to just tweak it to where That's actually really good right there. So now we got the top piece here, and I am gonna have Bridger hold this flush while I tack it. When I do that, yeah, use your thumb to feel it. Okay. So you'll be able to feel when it's flush. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so our first two sections are fit up now going pretty well and we're gonna move to the next one we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing Okay, so we got our pan all fit up. It's pretty straight. There's a little bit of flex in there from after we welded it, but I think it looks pretty good. We cleaned up all the spots where we welded on the inside of the pan so the material doesn't get hung up on it. So now the pan is ready to be fit to the table. And I think we're gonna put it on this side. 
I've got to figure out how I want to attach that. I'm going to think on that for a minute and we'll come back to you. Okay, so I just want to give you guys an update on where we're at. We're getting ready to mount our pan onto the table. And so I've taken and marked out a line here. Six inches inside each end of the pan and then one on center. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these pieces of angle and I'm going to mount them up underneath here. I'm going to kind of set them in a little bit so that the pan is up underneath the table so that when the material is rolling off the rollers it's not snagging on bolts or the edge of the table or anything like that or the edge of the pan. So the pan will actually sit in a little bit. I think I'm going to drill some holes in these pieces of angle. So we'll weld these clips on and then we'll be able to just bolt the pan on. That way if they don't want to use the pan they can just unbolt the pan and pull it off. I think that's going to be best for them. So we're going to work on getting these tacked on here. We got to drill them first so we're going to drill them and then tack them on and then we're going to take and punch the holes in the pan and we should be able to throw it up, bolt it on and the only thing left to do will be to cut our slots. So we'll get this knocked out first then we'll go to the slots. All right, we're gonna use a 3 8 bolt to mount these. So I'm using a 13 32nd bit so that I got a little bit of wiggle room. I'm not gonna use a center drill for something like this just because it's gonna be plenty precise enough if we just center the bit in our center pot. I just want to put a mark center of hole so that when we tack them we're at least close just like that now when we go to tack it you can hold that line center with that line and it'll be in line Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Just kind of push it in about like that. But then you got to get this lined up. And then put your spacer in there. And then I'll hit it. Okay? Okay. See, I don't want to put any weld here because our pan's going to go here. So I'm going to run one here and then on the inside. And I think I'm actually going to trigger these so that I'm not putting a ton of heat into them. kind of good 
at doing stuff like this by yourself when you do it a lot. Ready? Mm -hmm. Right here. But you can't get it here, you need to get it up in here. Okay? When I tell you. Go. Okay. All right, so you can see one of the other things we've done is we've rounded the corners down here. I like to round corners on stuff. I also think it gives it a finished look. Just another one of those things that I like to do. All right, let's see if we can get the pan over there and we'll get, we'll get it punched and then we'll see if we can hang it. Center. Mm -hmm. Sixteen. Okay, now let's go lay out the pan. Okay, so we're going to use a 3 8 by 1 inch bolt, put a flat washer on either side, lock washer, and a nut. Recipe for success. It's not going to go through. Okay, so the problem we're having with this middle one is we did get a little bit of warpage out of our pan. We're just going to ream the hole out just a little bit. It's just barely off.
it's time for today's Super Cool Tool. Alright guys, so for today's Super Cool Tool, we're going to be talking forklift. Forklift is something that really makes your life a lot easier when you run a welding business, fabrication business, and you're moving around heavy stuff all the time. This, this is definitely a piece of equipment that I bought that has made my life a lot easier. Once you start doing bigger stuff, you basically just have to have it. I knew I was getting to the point with doing a lot of reamers and stuff that I had to have something. There was times where the customer would show up with these great big reamers and he'd back his trailer in here. Well, sometimes he's pulling a you know, 40 foot trailer and so it's tough for him to back it in here and for me to get the crane positioned in just the right spot to where I could pick up these great big reamers and be able to move them across the shop. So it got to the point where I knew I had to have a forklift. So I started shopping around and this was in the middle of everything getting hard to find during COVID. And it got to the point where I had basically just given up and thought, you know what, I'm gonna wait until this whole COVID thing blows over and then I'll start looking for one again because it was just such a challenge to find a decent forklift. Luckily enough, I gave my name and number to a couple different places in Salt Lake City and so they were kind of keeping an eye out for me and a couple weeks later a guy called me said, hey we just got one in, I think it's going to be perfect for you. It's used, it's got lower hours, it's in great shape and we just put a new motor in it the motor was under warranty. Everything on the forklift came with a warranty on it. I was able to test it out. They delivered it to me the same day that he called me. Anything that I found that was wrong with it, they sent a mechanic out, he fixed it on their dollar. So that when I bought the forklift, it was in good condition. This forklift here is a 5,000 pound capacity. It does run on propane. I do like that because it's super low CO, so I can run it in here for short periods of time and not have to worry about opening a door or something like that. It gets pretty good mileage. I mean, I don't want to drive it across town or anything, but one bottle will last me quite a while. So I, I'm not sure what the lifting, like what the height capacity is on it, but I mean, it'll lift as high as I need to because my shop is only 16 feet tall. So if you follow the channel, and you follow me on Instagram, you know that when I got it, I did drill the holes in the forks. And I've heard mixed things. I've, I've taken some backlash for that because they say you're not supposed to do it because it weakens the forks. But to be honest, I don't lift anything on the last three inches of the forks. And I think as long as you're smart, I feel like you can avoid any incident that that little hole is going to cause. Every forklift I ran at the previous jobs that I had, they all had holes in them. And there are a few reasons that I do think it's safer. One of the reasons that I drill the holes in the forks is so that I can take a trailer ball, drop it in the hole, and then I can move trailers around with it. I also use the ball for a stop. So if I've got a strap on there that I don't want to slide off the fork, if I put this on, that avoids any sort of incident where the strap might slide off. So it's just some added safety. So there's a lot of uses for it. If I have to take the forks into something and then lift up and hook the backside of something and pull it back, or sometimes somebody will load something on my trailer too far back to where I need to pull it back, so I'll rig a strap up to it, I'll put it on the ball, and I'll back up and drag it across the trailer to where I can get a better bite at it. So there's a lot of uses for it. So that's why I drill the holes in my forks. This forklift does have lights front and back, which is really good for me because I spend a lot of time out here in the dark. And a lot of times I have to load or unload my trailer in the dark. And so for me to have lights front and back, it's safer, I'm able to see what I'm doing. So that's another feature I like about it. For those of you who don't know how the controls are on a forklift, I'll show you. So for those of you who have never ran a forklift, I'll just show you the basic operation of a forklift. And most of them are typically all the same. 
I'm not going to guarantee they're all the same, but they're pretty close. And when I say the controls, I mean these controls for the hydraulics. Okay, so this forklift has a safety, so I have to have it running, and I have to be sitting in the seat to be able to use the controls. So I'm going to start it up. Okay, so now we're running. So the first handle is your up and down. If you pull it down towards you, it goes up. If you push it forward, it goes down. The second knob is your tilt. Tilts it back, tilts it forward. The third knob, and not every forklift has this, that's one other feature that I really like about this forklift, is it has side shift. And so side shift, if you push it down, it goes to the right. And if you push it forward or up, it goes to the left, which is really nice when you're trying to load something or unload something and you didn't get exactly square, you can just shift your mast over and then you'll be lined up. This here is your auxiliary. So there's attachments you could put on this, like if you're gonna run, like if you wanna add a hydraulic drum dolly on here that grabs 50 gallon drums, if you add that on, you can connect the hydraulics and then this will run the jaws on that. So it's just kind of an auxiliary for any sort of attachment you would add. When you're driving, everything's pretty much the same. On this one, it's an automatic. And so your brake is left, your gas is right. And personally, when I, when I drive a forklift and everybody I know that drives one, you want to learn how to operate with both feet which is kind of strange because that's not how you're taught how to drive. And when you first start learning it, it's kind of weird. And so you need to learn how to use your left foot on the brake and your right foot on the gas. Some forklifts are manual, so they have a clutch. So when you drive, put your foot on the brake, take the emergency brake off, you got forward, and then you got reverse. Most of the newer forklifts are all that way. Your shifter is right here on the left side and they put them right there so that you can reach it with your hand while you're steering because you usually steer with one hand and that's why they have a knob so you're steering with your left hand you're operating hydraulics with your right hand so there's a lot going on you're using your brake with your left foot you're using your gas with your right foot you're steering with your left hand and you're operating the hydraulics with your right hand so if you get the opportunity to learn how to operate a forklift, I would take advantage of it because it's something that you can take numerous, numerous places. So it's a very, it's a very diverse skill that you can learn and you can use almost anywhere. If you know how to operate a forklift, it's just another arrow in your quiver. I've ran multiple brands, Nissan, Toyota, Heister, Lowell, Gell. So I've operated numerous brands and most of the ones I just listed are really good. I really like the Heister brand, and I would recommend it if you are in the market for a forklift. There's a lot of good brands out there though. This is my forklift. It's been an awesome, awesome tool in the shop. It has definitely helped my business grow. That's gonna be today's super cool tool. Let's get back to the project. This is basically what we're dealing with here. The company bought a set of drive rollers, this exact same brand, and they wanted us to build the table so that it would work for their application. And the good thing is, is I can get all my measurements off these because it's the exact same brand. So I'm gonna lay them out with the same hole pattern. We'll be able to set this one up. Okay, so we're gonna come 10 inches off the end of the table. drive rolls as close to the edge of the table as possible or as close as we dare go we're gonna go three inches
Okay, that's right on the money, and it ain't going anywhere. So I think what I want to do is take the mag drill, and I'm going to drill four holes, and that'll be my start and stop points, and it'll also give it a nice radius at the end of the slot. That way it's not just a crappy looking free hand that looks like an alligator bit it off or something. I'll grab the mag drill and we'll go ahead and drill these. Alright, so I just wanted to give you guys an update. We got our slots cut. We just went ahead and used a rip fence on that and got those cut. That side over there warped a little bit. That's why we've got the piece of tube clamped to it. I'm hoping that when it cools, it'll cool as flat as possible. I knew we were going to get a little warpage as close to the as close to the edge as we were but I think it's still gonna work okay even if there is some warpage there once they get the rollers bolted to the table it's gonna take that warpage out and it's really not gonna matter so hopefully you guys can understand now what's going on with the slots so these rollers will bolt into the slots and then they'll be able to slide this idler in and out depending on what size of roll they're putting on the rollers that's the purpose of the table so all that's left to do is a little bit of cleanup here i'm going to go ahead and hit this with a grinder clean up the top of the table again and we'll go to that point <laughs> I had a piece of square tube here bolted down across the table. When I cut this second slot here, we got a little bit of warpage. And it's not a ton, but there is a little bit. So, there is some movement there. So my fix for that, and I, I was fully expecting there was gonna be a little bit of warpage as close to the edge as that is. So my fix for that, I'm gonna take a piece of four inch channel here and I'm gonna tack it up underneath like so. I'm gonna weld it on here like this so that the bolt can still go through the slot and they can still slide the rollers up and down the table. I'll probably just put a pipe stand underneath this and I'll jack it up until 
this is exactly where it needs to be like right there and then I'll go ahead and weld it on both sides and let it cool and then it should be good I'm gonna cut one more of these and then we'll go ahead and get these welded on got the level up on the table just to make sure we're flat so I got a piece of the channel on a pipe stand here and I've raised it up to where it's nice and flush so I'm ready to tack it I just laid out my marks here center of our groove but I'll tack it up first and then I'm just gonna stitch weld this on on both sides so we'll go to that point Got our pieces of channel all welded in. Hopefully this makes sense to you now. So this idler is gonna slide in the groove back and forth depending on what size of roll of material they need to use. So if they slide it all the way down, they can dispense a four foot roll. If they slide it all the way out, they can dispense, I believe he said it's a 14 foot roll. I'm pretty happy with how the flatness of the table turned out it's not perfect you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to anybody it's not perfect but it is pretty dang good you can see how flat the idler is on that I did get the flats all welded up so hopefully you guys can see what I mean by the nice finished look it gives it when you trigger those verticals and then, you know, if I have a start or a stop that sticks out a little further than I wanted it to, I feather it, I feather it with a grinder. So, there's just little things you can do to make your welds look better. That's going to wrap up the table itself. We do have another little project we have to do for this. So, the customer brought this over last night. And it's just a counter. So, it's going to count how many yards of material they use. But he wants it mounted like this. So it's going to mount like this. I've got an idea of what I want to do here. It's going to have to be under spring tension. So that it pushes up on the roll. So that when the roll pushes down on it. That wheel has plenty of traction. I'm going to take a piece of angle. That's going to mount to the bottom of this. And on the back side it'll have like a bushing. And then it'll have a flat bar base. With a piece of rod sticking up. That runs through the bushing or the piece of pipe or whatever you want to call it and then it will be spring loaded so that it pushes up and I haven't got the spring loaded part worked out yet I've just got a design worked up in my head that I'm going to start with and just going to build off of that so I'd like to try to get this done tomorrow because I got all kinds of stuff piling up all of a sudden so we'll see what we can't get done all right guys let's go over what I got going here so I've got a piece of 3 16 flat bar, 4 inches wide by 4 inches wide. I got a piece of 2 by 2 angle, I think it's 4 and 3 quarter wide. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to take this piece of angle, I'm going to mount this in here. There's some, you can see there's some holes in that. 
So I'm going to use two of those holes to mount this piece of angle like so. Okay, then I'm going to take these pieces of pipe, those are our bushings, and I'm going to weld two of those to the back of this. One here, and one here. And then what I'll do is I'll use this rod to drive up and down like this. It'll have a spring below it. And I'm thinking of either threading this end or I'll cut a snap ring groove in it and use a snap ring on the end of it with a washer. And that'll keep it retained. That's how I'll get the washer on and that'll give us our travel up and down. I'm a little worried that it might bind up a little bit. So we're just gonna have to try it and see. I'm gonna start by working on mounting this to this piece of angle. So I'll get my transfer punch set I'll transfer punch these. Then we can start worrying about TIG welding the bushings on. We'll see what we can do there. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, the center drill really serves two purposes. It can get you centered exactly on your center pop. The other purpose it serves is when you first start drilling, it helps so that the drill bit doesn't wander. So it keeps it centered right where you want it, just in case you were wondering. The other thing that's nice is I'm already lined up. I center drilled it. I was perfectly lined up with my center pop. Then all you gotta do is center drill it, swap your bit out, you're already dead center, and then drive her home. Okay, that's mounted. I think we'll add some washers when we do the final assembly. So now we can move on to figuring out where we want these. I know we want to be probably as wide as we can. That's three, so three. So if we go three inches on here, so I'm gonna to have to clean the paint off these, clean them up, probably go over to the Burr King, do that, knock the paint off of them. We can drag the TIG welder out, set it all up, and get ready to weld these on. <laughs> Scales cleaned off, got the end of them all chamfered, cleaned up, used my little reamer on the inside, so we should be good. So now we're ready to figure out where they go on the little bracket and then go ahead and weld them on. Alright, so we're over here at the lathe and we're going to take our pieces of rod and I've decided we're going to cut a snap ring groove in them and then the snap ring will hold the washer from sliding off. So we're gonna go ahead and throw these in here. Cut that little groove. I've actually already got a piece of this tool still ground down with the profile I need on it for this snap ring because I've already used these snap rings for a, another project and went ahead and ground this for the other project. So I already got it ready, so that's gonna save us a little time. I'm going to go ahead and 
check that with my snap ring. I'm cheating using some really small needle nose pliers because I apparently don't have a small enough set for this size snap ring. Okay, that's just right. Okay, one down. It's always a win if you can keep from shooting this across the shop while you're testing it. That's just right. Okay, so there's the plan. It's tacked together, it slides up and down that smooth, and it's hot. So we're gonna take that with us, go see if we can't get some springs. We got 15 minutes to get the hardware store, so we're gonna burn down there, see if they got the springs we need. Well, we failed. Hardware store was closed, closed an hour ago. They changed their times and didn't tell me, so. Apparently we're going to have to wait till tomorrow to get some springs. We got some other projects we got to work on so we're going to shift gears and go do that. And we'll come back to this project when we get some springs. Alright guys, we just got back from the hardware store. We found some springs, but we didn't find the length we need. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to line these up. I'll be able to line those up together like that. And just tack that together. And they'll work just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and get those tacked up, then we'll go over and see how they work. So let's do it. Okay, so I just got a little tack both sides there. It's going to work just dandy. Okay, so there's our springs. And if I take and mount those on there, I'm not putting a whole bunch of pressure on that.
All right, guys. I think we've got this finished. Runs nice and smooth. It should be just about right there. And that'll give it just enough pressure that it should count. I think it's gonna work. All that's left to do now is just mount it to the rollers. They talked about either throwing a couple tack welds on there or we can do some self tappers or bolts or whatever. I think that's it for this one. That's gonna wrap up the roller table. Hope you guys enjoyed watching. Hope you guys learned something. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so. We appreciate all you guys that watch and like and subscribe and all that good stuff. It's gonna wrap it up. See you on the next one. Thank you to our program. <laughs> Welcome to our program. I said thank you. Oh. <laughs> it's always nice when you're sitting on the floor welding overhead like that and you get a hot one hit the floor ends up right next to your butt crack or your bean bag. <laughs> you don't want to move because you don't want to screw up your weld. But it's too really hot. This forklift here has a 5,000 pound capacity. Um, um, this forklift here has a 5,000 pound capacity. It is propane. It does run. <gasps> uh, so that I can take trailer ball. I'm able to Okay, you need to you need to get more of the big picture and less of this. <laughs>